Welcome to the Wild Connections presentation on wolf reintroduction in Colorado. Our speaker to, uh, this evening is Dr. Carl Ford. Um, Carl Ford is an expert in ecology. Uh, he is not as much an expert in Zoom, so please be patient with him. Let me hand it over to Carl. Okay, well, thanks, Allison, um, and all my good friends at Wild Connections. Thanks for um, giving me this chance to talk to you a little bit about uh, Colorado's wolf uh, restoration and management plan. I'm going to um, I'm going to share my screen and load up at my uh, PowerPoint. I have a video in there. We'll see if that works. If not, um, we will push on. So before I uh, get into the nitty gritty of the wolf uh, management a reintroduction plan. I wanted to uh, kind of share the concept of rewilding with you if you're not familiar with it. So there's a whole phase, a fairly new phase of ecological science called conservation biology. And some of the giants uh, in this field are Michael Soule and Reed Noss. And they talk about rewilding as being the scientific argument for restoring big wilderness based on the regulatory roles of large predators. What they mean basically is large predators can control the whole health of the ecosystem. And what it really means uh, in their language, in our language, are three things. They call them the three C's. Cores meaning like core habitat to identify those important areas. Corridors, which are basically uh, corridors between those core habitats so that uh, native species can move from one location to another. And finally, carnivores, which we're gonna talk about today. They go on to say that the structure and the resilience and diversity of ecosystems is often regulated by top-down ecological interactions initiated by top predators. And this same kind of thinking is um, largely uh, held by the 30 by 30, meaning 30% 30 of the land and waters is a goal to be protected by 2030. It's a goal of the Biden administration and, min and most conservation groups. So, okay, now here's gonna get a little tricky here. I'm going to try to play a video. So I have to stop sharing for a minute out of PowerPoint. And I'm gonna load this four minute video that kind of explains a little better what I'm talking about. And it's by Dave and Attenborough, if you're familiar with him. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. 
before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. Okay, so I have to close that. Are we back? Yes, I can see your screen. Thank you. So did the video show for everybody? It worked perfectly for me. Thank you, Carl. Even if uh, David Attenborough doesn't know the difference between a deer and an elk. There you go. Yeah, it was a bit of a cheerleading uh, thing, but I thought it really packed a lot of the uh, favorable changes in Yellowstone, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in a really short amount of time. So let's move on to the actual plan itself. Get back to my 
screen. So how's the Colorado Parks and Wildlife going to manage wolf populations? And is there a wolf population objective? There's a lot of verbiage here. I'm gonna kind of take my time going through this um, so that you get a better feel for the plan if you haven't had a chance to look at it. There's going to be a phased approach and it's based on number of animals in the state. And it's kind of correlated to the state uh, of Colorado's threatened endangered species list. So phase one is where, we, where we're going to be this year. Wolves are to be reintroduced by the end of the calendar year. And um, they plan on, as I get into phase two, uh, they're going to be um, reintroducing some unknown number of wolves this year, probably in the fall maybe in the winter in November, December. And um, I'm guessing it's probably maybe, you know, a couple of dozen at the most. In phase two, um, they will, by the way, they'll, they'll be threatened as long as there are less, excuse me, they'll be endangered as long as there are less than 50 wolves in the wintertime count. So I'm actually now down here in phase two. Um, as long as there are 50 wolves uh, in the state, they will be classified uh, as endangered. I'm sorry, if they're less than 50. If they start to grow beyond that, and that's 50, by the way, in four successive years, um, it, they can move to a total delisting status. So that would be uh, if they reach either 150 wolves anywhere in two successive years, or a minimum of 200 wolves anywhere at any time in Colorado. So kind of, kind of restating here, we start out with uh, wolves being endangered, numbers less than 50. If they increase over 50, uh, they will be downlisted to threatened. If they increase to over 150 or 200, depending on those circumstances, they would be delisted altogether. And finally, uh, the plan goes on to say that if there are enough wolves, they may be classified as a game species, meaning they can be hunted. So a couple of questions that the plan doesn't really uh, address is, well, what if those numbers uh, get above 50, maybe say 75, maybe 90, and then they drop back below 50, what happens? Does that mean that um, they would Let's say if they drop below 50, would they introduce more wolves or not? It's not clear about that. And then in phase three, if wolf numbers, wolf numbers drop below 150 for two years, does that mean that they would be relisted as state threatened? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions there and throughout the plan, I'm gonna highlight some of those as I go along. This is a very interesting question. Uh, how did Colorado Parks and Wildlife decide where to introduce the wolves? So uh, CPW hired or retained Colorado State University wildlife biologists. Uh, they published a paper, lead author is Dittmer. Um, and I thought it was really interesting the way they approached this. So they, in their mind, there are two aspects about uh, where to introduce wolves. One of them has to do with human conflict. So this right side of the track here um, has to do with they mapped out livestock density, not only on private land, but also on federal lands where there's uh, grazing allotments, both on federal, on BLM and on Forest Service. They also looked at the wolf vote statewide, and we'll look at that in a minute. And they also looked at land ownership, private versus federal. And they came up with a conflict, conflict risk map. And I'll show you more about that in just a second. This other side of the track has to do with the wolves themselves. So they looked at the prey habitat preference, mainly elk and deer. Where are those herds in the uh, state west of the continental divide? Uh, so where is their ideal prey habitat? And then where is the human footprint? So for instance, wolves are not gonna last long in the uh, municipal boundaries of Grand Junction, Colorado, for instance, or in areas that are heavily in agriculture. 
And finally, uh, they had some a category called hunting success. And that takes into account um, things like elevation, uh, high, high altitude in the wintertime, for instance, is not going to be uh, successful for wolf, wolves to hunt. So they developed an ecological suitability map. And then they overlaid it. And I'm going to show you some more of these maps a little better where you can actually see them. But across the bottom here, at the bottom of my screen, is the um, ecological suitability. It goes from white to green. And <clears throat> this matrix is going on the y-axis going um, up from white to, to pink is the conflict risk from humans. And the conflict risk is largely um, based on how people voted county by county. So if you're familiar with Colorado's geography by counties, um, the darkest green counties voted in favor uh, of the wolf reintroductions by the largest amounts, and those are shown in green. So we have Denver, we have Boulder, we have Pitkin, and we have um, San Miguel County, which is Telluride. And then we also have in other greens, we have Larimer, we have Adams and um, Arapahoe and Jefferson, barely, El Paso, barely, Summit County, um, San Juan County, which is Silverton, and also La Plata, which is the Durango area. And the darkest red areas voted in highest numbers against wolf reintroduction. So in the extreme east part of the state, where you have a lot of farming and some ranching, and in the northwest part of the state, where we have a lot of ranching, uh, pretty much voted uh, heavily against it. And so it's not just a matter of those counties, but this also shows the populations in those counties. So the front range heavily influenced the vote. This is the size, the number of people in those counties that voted for it, indicated by the size of the circles. And you can see that throughout the Western Slope over here, mostly small uh, counties in terms of population vote. So here's that conflict slash ecological suitability risk matrix. And so what we see is a combination of greens and pinks and blues. So areas that are green, um, just green, like up in here, this is north of Walcott Junction, um, have very high ecological suitability for wolves and very low conflict risk. Um, however, if you went up to like North Park in the Walden area, where wolves have uh, returned on their own. There is uh, more conflict there. Looking down, looking throughout the eastern slope, uh, actually this is the front range over here, uh, Denver area, um, Larimer, Weld counties, parts of Boulder uh, counties up in here, as well as areas of down around uh, San Luis Valley, uh, et cetera, have a lot of human risk or conflict risk. Um, and areas, so areas that are blue are probably not really that great. So over here, Delta, Olathe, Montrose, probably not really good, but you can start to see where wolves have a chance to live in Colorado. This is the, uh, another view of the ecological suitability map. And the only reason I'm showing this one is there's a difference between summer and winter. So in summertime, um, high elevations, wolves are able to disperse there. Uh, and so in this case, the most ecologically suitable are the yellows and oranges. But if you look over on the right side, this is the winter map. And you can see a lot of this uh, yellow and orange goes away because it's above tree line and there are not many elk or other prey for the wolves to hunt. So now I've added in the continental divide uh, in Colorado. Remember the ballot initiative only allowed them to introduce wolves west of the continental divide. And also the divide makes this big jog uh, over here down around Creed and then back along the South San Juans. This is not the state boundary with Utah, by the way, it's clear over here. Um, but we're focusing on, uh, on this area, at least this is from the wolf plan. This is where they focused a lot of attention. And these are the two areas that they actually proposed to 
introduce wolves. So this one has kind of a center point here between Vale and Glenwood and Aspen, so kind of so right in the middle there would be that um, area. And of course, they don't say exactly where they would introduce them. And then there's another uh, introduction area that they're proposing down with kind of Gunnison in the middle. These white areas, by the way, are high altitude. And so probably would not be that suitable for wolves year round. So I, I took this map and I drew in some more circles and arrows. These are the same circles we saw before. And uh, this is summertime uh, suitability for wolves. And I've drawn in some arrows. The wolves are going to move. So you see an opportunity for them to move up towards Rocky Mountain National Park to see them potentially moving uh, towards the Sangre de Cristos and also down through the San Juans, at least in the summertime. And I've done the same thing in the winter. Um, wolves also will, will probably move some. They're not gonna stay necessarily where they're put. So these are just some of the possibilities. And as you know, Wild Connections is concerned with the central Colorado area the watersheds of the upper Arkansas and the upper South Platte. So this whole area east of the divide now is likely to receive some wolves at some point. Okay, so that's a little bit about the introductions and locations. I wanna move along quickly here to some wolf management tools that are in the plan. So they describe a circumstance and then they describe some tools that are available. Uh, to the state. And the first one is non-injurious, non-lethal conflict. So where wolves are maybe chasing livestock, for instance. Uh, in this case, the owners are allowed to use various hazing tools, um, guard dogs, uh, burrows, um, ladry, which is uh, like surveyor's tape on fences, um, anything short of actually killing them. The next one is, and I've highlighted the word, word, the word take. So if biologists use the word take meaning kill, taking an endangered species or taking a threatened species is killing it. So taking is allowed for self-defense, meaning for humans. That is very unlikely. I did a bit of research, maybe some of you know, know this. There has not been a documented wolf uh, attack that resulted in a fatality in North America since the 19, since 1900, um, except there have been one in Alaska in 2010 and one in Saskatchewan in 25, the year 25. Um, the chances of being attacked and killed by dogs is vastly larger than being attacked by wolves. And this is, you know, it's really not likely that would ever happen. Of course, a person can defend themselves in that situation or their family, um, however, whatever means necessary. Um, the next one would be taking for attack on livestock. The owner is empowered to kill. They are supposed to get a permit and they have to, in order to get reimbursement, there has to be proof, some kind of proof, the wolves actually kill the animal. I'll talk about compensation in a minute. CPW can also send out agents to kill and so can uh, the Department of Agriculture. They have um, the Agricultural Research Service likes to kill predators, as you may know, they kill tens of thousands every year. Um, the next one is a government, the government agency, meaning CPW, can take to reduce impact on wild ungulates. So this has to do with elk and deer, especially elk populations. They're afraid that wolves could cause a reduction in elk populations. And the way they phrase it, if, if these various hunt management units, um, they all have a number of elk or deer that they are trying to target CPW as managing for so many elk, like 1,000 or 600 or 1,200, during these, in these various units. And they call that management objectives. And if they're not meeting their management objectives under this provision of the plan, they can go in and kill wolves. 
unless there are less than 150 statewide. So, you know, there's that. One other point here I wanted to mention is they're going to have GPS monitors on every pack. Um, they tend to get lost and wolves with monitors tend to die. So there's you know, going to be an ongoing effort to keep track of them using GPS monitoring. By the way, uh, there'll be time for questions at the end. So I hope you're jotting some down as we go along. Um, the compensation program is required uh, under the state uh, law, it's a statute now, uh, to pay, pay fair compensation to owners for any losses of livestock caused by wolves. The program is going to allow up to 100% of fair market value up to a maximum of $8,000 per animal. So it can be cattle, horses, mules, burros, sheep, lambs, swine, llama, et cetera. And I imagine there probably are, is some livestock, especially breeding livestock worth $8,000. Unlikely, I guess, that a lot of these others would be. So you might be asking, well, what is the penalty uh, if a person illegally uh, takes or kills um, a wolf uh, under state law? So unauthorized take is, is punishable by a fine of not less than $2,000 and not more than $100,000 or by imprisonment for not more than a year. You know, it'll, we'll have to see how that goes um, because I think there will be illegal killing of wolves. We know from other states in the Rocky Mount, Northern Rockies area, and also in New Mexico, where they have uh, reintroduced Mexican wolves, that uh, ranchers and others will illegally take wolves and they follow the policy, the, the three S's of shoot, shovel, and shut up. So here's some concerns, and I'm not going to read all these, the verbiage here, but I'll just try to kind of hit the highlights. Uh, we have put these in our talking points on our website and also on the announcement, I think, that we sent out an email about the, the talk tonight. Um, I will, I'll mention it now, and I'll do it again at the end. We only have about six days to get comments in. The comment period ends on February 22nd. So I hope that you will um, jot some of these ideas down or copy them from the email or from the website, sort through them and see what's important to you and send in a letter to the CPW. The first one is the plan really should be more specific about the number of breeding pairs and total number of wolves. Um, it's really not very clear throughout the plan. The second one that bothers me is that the state has authority to perform lethal control with no public oversight. And I suggest that we, that we insist on a stakeholders committee. It can include ranchers, it can include uh, conservationists, uh, but there needs to be some oversight because in other states, Oregon, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, uh, the state is going in and killing wolves uh, almost excessively. And there's really no way to question that. So I would like to see uh, some ability for a committee of stakeholders outside the committee outside of CPW to review these cases and make sure that there's some oversight. The plan also goes on, and I'm on my third bullet here. The studies are ambiguous on the effects of lethal control and subsequent depredations, meaning killing of livestock. A bunch of academic studies have done, and it really doesn't show a relationship between going in and killing wolves for that reason. And I guess I'm asking, is it just trying to satisfy the public that the wolves have been punished? Um, in some states, they're going out, and instead of killing uh, a couple of wolves, they're re removing entire packs. Uh, whether or not the whole pack is involved in the killing. And I realize, you know, that if there's a couple of wolves in a pack that are doing the killing, probably the others would be getting involved as well. Um, the plan on chapter four doesn't really dis discuss management differences between phases one and two. 
and whether or not there'll be any more introductions uh, and at what levels would be more introductions be uh, take place because you know they may only put a couple of dozen wolves in and uh, the most common cause of wolf wolf deaths or mortality are number one other wolves and number two humans um, some will be hit by cars a lot will be shot Um, also, here's another issue is the plan allows the killing of wolves without requiring ranchers to remove carcasses. And leaving those carcasses will draw more wolves into the area and may, more wolves may, may be then eliminated. I'm also concerned about poisoning and trapping. Poisoning and trapping are not mentioned in the plan. The problem with poisoning is a lot of, most of the poisons that are used to kill wolves uh, will kill any animal that eats it. So if you had a dead, dead cow out there and they put poison in it, strychnine or whatever, it's going to kill any animal that feeds on it, including bald eagles and ravens and magpies and coyotes and uh, just about any predator that will eat dead animals. And most of them will if they're hungry enough. Here's one, um, the public land question. Some people... I took this off of another uh, conservation organization. They don't think that wolves should be killed on public lands because that should be a refuge for them. Uh, having worked for BLM, I have some mixed feelings about that. Um, and also both BLM and Forest Service have hundreds of grazing allotments. And it's lawful, whether I like it or not, for ranchers to graze their animals on those allotments. And so, you know, think about that. Um, in phase, uh, phase three, after 200, 150 to 200 is reached, they're gonna be totally delisted. And um, many feel that, that number is too low for the entire state. Having said that, the number of wolves in Yellowstone National Park is now down around 100. But in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, it's several times that number. And in Idaho now, there's over a thousand wolves. So, um, you know, how many wolves is enough? Uh, I guess how many wolves humans will tolerate is the question. I'm not gonna read this one. This has to do with elk populations and man management objectives for elk. Sometimes I think CPW, you know, they, they get all their funding from licensing of big game hunters and fishing. And so elk hunting is a really big deal to them. And they want to manage for the largest numbers of elk that they can. And, um, and the elk hunters also are an important lobbying organization. So, you know, there will be pressure to kill wolves to keep the elk numbers up. Here's the question. What about wolves moving to the eastern slope? The plan is completely silent on that. We assume that there will be no different management. This last bullet, I'm going to, um, I'm not going to read all this, but I will say that under the plan, you have to get a permit to kill a wolf. And <clears throat> you, you have to uh, have that permit to take wolves within 24 hours of wounding or killing of livestock. So if you're a rancher, uh, and you don't have any mortality, and then suddenly you have a dead animal, um, you, you can apply for a permit, um, but the CPW has to investigate the damage and within 24 hours, determine it was wolves before they issue a permit. The whole thing is really cumbersome. I just don't see how that's gonna work. Um, is it gonna be limited to only landowners? And what about employees, ranch employees? How long is the permit good for? How is it terminated? Uh, how many wolves can they kill? Um, there's so many questions about that. So um, this has been a, a high level view of the uh, CPW's draft Colorado Wolf Restoration and Management Plan. As I mentioned, the comment period ends coming up here in six days um, and you can comment by Will this work? This may not work. Um, can you see that website, Allison? Uh, no, we still see your 
presentation, I've put the link into the comments. Okay, okay. so I'm going to try to get back to you myself here. Uh, I got lost here. So while I'm trying to get back to my final slide, which is a pretty picture of wolves, um, Allison, can we throw it out for questions or did anybody write anything in the chat boxes for questions? We had one comment in the um, chat box. Um, uh, Chris Canale, hi Chris, said, on another wolf presentation by Defenders of Wildlife, it was suggested by a participant that there be different groups sponsoring a wolf pack. Um, so they're able to track them, keep up on their progress and push Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, uh, to have to um, have this uh, public involvement. Yeah, that would be kind of a cool way to uh... Uh, you know, have some local people monitoring the situation, not just, you know, all the front range uh, populations, if we can get some people out in the Western Slope to participate too. I was also wondering if you could uh, talk about anything you particularly liked in the plan. I thought that the paper by Dittmer that, um, focused on how the uh, land would be um, chosen to give the wolves the best chance to survive both on their ecological requirements and on the least human conflict. I thought that was really well done. But ultimately the wolves are gonna go where they want to. Anyone has any, yep. If anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. In general, if you are submitting comments, the most useful comments are ones that are not just a copy of someone else's comments. Uh, it is important that we show um, that if you think that wolf reintroduction is a good idea, that we show support for this. Um, that Absolutely. I'm sure that the um, people reviewing the comments are going to be creating tallies of this many Comments uh, appeared to be supportive. This many comments appeared to be against. Um, specific comments uh, about parts of the plan that you think are good or parts that could be improved or are especially helpful rather than generalizations. Uh, any experience that people have, if anyone has, um, uh, been to visit wolves, if anyone could talk about the benefits to Colorado from people uh, coming. Those are um, good things to point out as well. Well, I have a minute if, if I could. I, I just wanted to share a personal experience. Um, I've seen a few wolves in Yellowstone. I've been fortunate enough to. And then a few years ago, um, my wife, Ann, and I were uh, hiking in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and we were doing a 100-mile segment of the Continental Divide Trail. And on the fifth day, we, uh, <laughs> we were going through an area of pretty thick riparian vegetation along a stream, and suddenly we heard this howling, and it was close. And then quickly we determined there were multiple voices of howls on both sides of the trail hidden. We never did see them. I at first thought they were dogs with some hikers, but they were constant, loud, howling, different voices. And we kept on going and we had our bear spray handy just in case. 
And, but it was such a thrilling, incredible experience and they never showed themselves. And they howled alongside us for probably quarter to a half a mile. And we think later on, we decided there was probably either a den there with pups that they wanted us to get out of there or maybe a carcass that they were protecting. Um, but they, they didn't threaten us other than letting us know they were there and um, they would appreciate it if we just moved on. So that was pretty cool. So let's see, there's another question. Do other states have the 200 maximum? Um, no, I don't think so. I will say though that um, in Wyoming, you can hunt wolves outside of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, they're considered predators and they can be shot on site. You don't need a license or anything. But that's why very few wolves make it to Colorado. All of Southern Wyoming, which is A, desert, can be classified as a predator zone and they can be shot on site. Um, Idaho and Montana uh, want to uh, hunt wolves. Maybe someone knows better than me what the status of that is. I think they've tried to open hunting seasons uh, several times, and I believe they've been tied up in lawsuits. So the question, next question I see is, um, what is your prediction about potential changes and what type of changes might be made after receiving public comments? I really have no idea. And that's why I think if they get enough comment on the th same thing, same issues, uh, hopefully they will um, address it. Um, I really don't know. I'm hopeful that they will address some of these things. We do have a question, where are the wolves uh, to be sourced from? I'm sure they'll come from the Northern Rockies groups uh, in Idaho, Montana, possibly the uh, greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, they, we want wolves that are genetically the kind that are supposed to be here, not Mexican wolves, for instance, not Arctic wolves. Um, they might possibly come from Canada, with, which is how they got the Yellowstone wolves in and the wolves that they introduced into Idaho in 1996. But now we have a fairly good wolf population in the Northern Rockies that they'll probably use. Okay, I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, last chance. Uh, if not, um, thanks for spending an, an hour or so with me tonight and uh, hope that you'll send some comments into that CPW website and let them know what you think. Let's see, here's a question. Um, there was a woman who initiated reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone and she worked with local persons. Um, the 1996 reintroduction in Yellowstone was taken by, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm sure they had some local people supporting that. Um, there is a question, is there any comparison on control compared to like Minnesota? So if you didn't know it, there are several thousand wolves in Minnesota and a few in Wisconsin. Um, and they have been there all this time. And they're in the northern parts of those states in fairly remote areas. Um, and they seem to, the locals and um, people in the state seem to tolerate them. And um, they seem to be doing okay. Um, some I think might be protected. I'm really not sure about their status though. Thank you very much, Carl. I really appreciate uh, all that you've shared with us. You've really helped Wild Connections to um, put together our comments. Um, I um, welcome everyone to come to Wild Connections webpage and learn more about our organization. Uh, if you 
have the means, uh, I request um, that you consider uh, donating to Wild Connections. It really helps us to uh, uh, do this work. And uh, thanks. Go to wildconnections.org if you want to donate. Thank you, Carl. We're um, none of us are real good at asking for money. So uh, I really appreciate all the support. Um, many of your names are familiar and they have been long term supporters. Um, we also have opportunities to join us on, on hikes and on projects. Um, I hope Carl will be leading another um, hike to help us learn about. Uh, how the uh, climate is changing in places that will remain um, viable as the climate changes. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm gonna stop the recording now so we can- Thanks everybody.